Welcome. Uh, I'm John, one of the uh, owners here, and Kelly's over there, the other owner. Um, and we are super excited to have Harold Gard with us tonight. He's one of our very favorite artists and people. Um, and we are so happy to be showing his work uh, again for the second time here at Cove Street. Um, so just a few words about the format, particularly for the people uh, that are watching it online. So we are live streaming on Facebook right now. Uh, and if you have questions, uh, go ahead and type them in the comments section. There's a bit of delay between us here in the gallery and the people watching on the live stream. So I encourage anyone on the live stream to go ahead and type in the questions when you have them because if you wait until the end, we may not see them. Um, we may stop the talk and two minutes later we see the question. Uh, so now just a bit about uh, Harold. He was born in New York in 1923. And so we were absolutely thrilled to have this exhibition here in year number 99 for Mr. Gard. If you waited, can you hear me? Yes. If you waited another couple of weeks, I would have been in my hundredth year. Oh. <laughs> See, poor planning, that would have gotten a standing ovation. Um, so, uh, so Harold received his uh, BA in Fine Arts at the University of Wyoming after serving in the Air Force during World War II. Uh, while at the University of Wyoming, he studied with leading abstract artist George McNeil, surrealist Leon Kelly, and geometric abstractionist painter Ilya Bulatovsky. Uh, Harold then returned to New York, completing a master's in Fine Arts and Education in 1951. Uh, in the early 1950s and 60s, Harold was part of the New York Abstract Expressionist. Uh, he became increasingly committed to figurative abstraction in the 70s and moved into neo-expressionism in the 80s and 90s before a return towards uh, more pure abstraction. Uh, his work is in all of the major museums here in Maine, as well as in many museums and collections throughout the country, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, before I turn things over to Harold, uh, I just want to raise two topics of note. Uh, so prepare your questions if you have them on these. Um, so many of you are very familiar with Harold's work here in the gallery, so you're already going to know what these are. But already one of the uh, main questions we get is, what is a strapo? Well, if you don't know what a strapo is, we have the innovator here, the person in the world to ask about them. Uh, so please do. Uh, and second, and I think this will be of particular interest to this audience, um, Harold's move to Maine had a significant impact on his work, including uh, and starting to incorporate more vibrant colors due to Maine's beautiful natural light. Uh, so that would be another good area of inquiry, um, the importance of geography uh, or place in Harold's work and particularly in Maine. And with that, I turn things over to Harold Gard. Uh, my thanks, of course, to all of you uh, here. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for being part of the, the population of Maine. I, I am so impressed with the decency and sense of sharing and concern that I found from the day I walked into Maine. It has been a treasure, and it's a treasure I do not take lightly. Then, Galleries opened in Maine, but I didn't quite expect to see one like this. And to see my work up in this space is really a, a treasure, and I, I appreciate deeply the choices, the skills. A good exhibit is a very difficult thing to manage. It's not easy, and when you do things over as long a period of time as I have, you learn what bad installations look like. You learn what bad selections can look like. But you also begin to appreciate how difficult it is to mount an exhibit. And I did not make it easy, because this is not of a never painted for a show. None of the work here was done for this show. Uh, not ha there's no 
sense of that cohesion, the only thing that brings it all to any kind of cohesion is me. And the most, most significant thing about me at the moment seems to be my age. When I, there was a time in my life it was my height. No, it's my age. And uh, uh, to have the opportunity in my 99th year to be sitting here is with family, friends, and with a sense uh, that this is purposefully designed to appreciate the artwork. And this installation is a gem. It really is that good. So I am so, so very, very pleased. But uh, as I point out often enough, the art is a very bad business. It's, it's a terrible business. Uh, but as a way of living, I can't think of anything that would have suited me better than, than this. So if I'm hanging around, it's because there's so much of that sense of support and purpose. Art is difficult. Enjoying art can be difficult. Uh, having it, uh, having it appreciated, is not easy either. It's uh, there's a remoteness between my feeling about my work as I see my work and my work as I think others might be seeing it. And uh, there is always a certain amount of storytelling that's involved, but the story that means the most to me, in summary, is the story you tell yourself when you see mine. They are not meant to be portraits of particular people or, or demonstrations of a particular motive, none of those things. They're supposed to be of their own world, and it's a world that you join and when you do, I feel honored because it means that there is a communication that happens on my most basic level between me and you as the viewer. So um, I can amble and ramble and such, but what I would like to do is actually respond to comments that I would appreciate tremendously, both comments and questions. Please, please help me out. Give me those. <laughs> Question, please. Um, I think I pick up enough of the question. Nobody could have been luckier than me on that. I think going to the University of Wyoming for an undergraduate degree because they provided veterans housing and I was relatively newly married and they accepted a lot of credits that nobody else would have accepted. And that's why I went to the University of Wyoming happened to fall in love with space, and I get a staff that's absolutely un unbelievable, a leading abstract artist of, of its time, for, for one, and a leading surrealist for another, Kelly Bolotovsky, a geometric abstractionist who knew and worked with Mondrian and Van Gogh and other things. And I, uh, as a New Yorker, came out there and worked for the department and got to know these people. And I mean, you have to have ridiculous amount of luck for these three 
people to be the staff of the art department. And it was challenging and wonderful. And then um, uh, there was a chance, anyway, I was invited to um, uh, stay on to do my master's in the English department. The university itself was so new and they didn't have endowments and they didn't have many other stuff. So the only department that had that was the English department and possibly some other, maybe the education department, I'm not sure. But uh, I was offered a fellowship in the English department for my writing and um, at the time I still wasn't sure whether I wanted to try to make a career in writing or in, in painting. But once I was in the studio and with these three people, there was no question at all. And my wife wanted to get back east to family and such. So I applied to, uh, uh, for an advanced degree in a number of uh, universities and Columbia University being right there in New York City is where I chose to, to go. Uh, so uh, there was also the luck of the times. I never had to really struggle in the same way uh, to get the education. There was already the history there, including for the people who were teaching out there. There was the WPA Arts that kept the art business alive for so many people, uh, particularly in New York. And uh, these were the people who continued to be important in the art world. So the, then there was the GI Bill which was this marvelous rev rev revolution that had uh, immense effect in giving us the good things that, that are, are in American life. And uh, I was able to go to, uh, uh, yeah, actually, I don't think I ever had to pay directly in, in any monetary way to any of the educational degrees that I got. And the other thing was New York City. I'm, there was no admission to get into the museums. It's where you would meet a friend to keep out of the rain. And it was such a, a cultural richness that uh, was just there. And it wasn't a matter of choosing. Uh, it was a matter of the, the availability and the sense there was among the people that the culture and the arts were significant, were meaningful, that there was a, a way of living that incorporated into its core the creative individual. You could get along pretty damn well if you just did almost nothing and got yourself only some kind of job of some kind that would pay the bills. And uh, it's not always easy, but it could be done. But the idea of being immersed in this kind of world, uh, the world of the arts, getting to see the theater, seeing some of the best theater that the world has ever known, uh, it, it, it just, you're there by walking in the door uh, and, and doing it. So, yeah, I've probably been as lucky as anybody could possibly imagine. Right time, right place, decided what color, the right color to be born uh, and where to do it. It was, life, life really was, uh, uh, a joy, and I hope that some of that joy reads into the paintings. Uh, oh, I need and want questions from anybody. Carol. Yes. But did you, did you study realism first, and then you did abstraction? 
Detroit. You know what? I wish somebody would repeat that. Or could you say it louder as they print, so I, people can hear it? Sarah, yeah. Did you do realism first and then do abstraction? Oh yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, a little bit. I followed that. I felt everybody could draw and everybody could write. So that that you could do. Uh, the idea of being born at the right time in the right place also was that uh, uh, I got away from the idea that you measured an artist by what, after having my mentors. You judge an artist by how well they could make a pencil drawing look like a photograph. There was not the learning that, that I got. So the idea that of getting into expressionism, that was far more difficult. The idea of using a sense of design and having it not for you to, felt very freeing. I said, okay, I don't have to render anything anymore the way I would have had to. I can do this, which is easier. So I started working on uh, a non-figurative work and then got dissatisfied because uh, I would paint out figurative things and then when I would see them, I would cover a canvas when I started and still very much did until recently. I do a non-figurative uh, workout for step number one. So the two-dimensional qualities had to dominate and then as I did it and would look at it and work at it, I very often would see in the paint various symbols. And the, uh, uh, I would I'd actually paint them out. If they look like figurative things, I would paint them out. If they look like objects, I would paint them out. And then say, I'm losing too much of the emotional content. You have more than one figure in a painting. You have psychodrama. You can't <laughs> help it. It's a, just like in lives. If you have more than one person involved, relationships are not going to be easy. So this, the idea of beginning to see that there's a communication that happens when I have various symbols and very often putting them together in ways that I had not even planned on, but I will use it as discovery. And the, the surface of the painting be, was my sense of what do I discover when I look at these colors, the relationship to, and the sense of formality that's required a well-balanced painting, and what makes something a good painting. And good painting then said, if it had symbols in them, they had to be more original than rendering. So I very quickly, very, very quickly decided to allow the emotional thing that I was feeling to be right there on my paintbrush. And it became figurative. And there was never any desire to pre study or to predetermine where that would go. So I didn't, I never painted to illustrate a mood. I never painted to illustrate a, it never was supposed to look like my Uncle Max or anything like that. They had to look like a, the most generalized uh, male or female ones. And then along the way, you, when you get into trouble with that one, and I, like somebody said, you know, I don't think Harold likes women very much, looking at his paintings. And she said, did you ever see what his male looked like? <laughs> <laughs> so there, so the, the pathway, the pathway to contemporary uh, uh, picture making is I think in for an incredible jolt because of the age of the computer. And uh, I, I don't know the, how that's going to be, uh, have an effect on future generations 
or how it would have affected me now uh, if I were beginning to teach instead of after my, my teaching career. There's a different sense of what we see and how we see it and how we manipulate it. And manipulation is, is the whole, that's the whole trick is to, and it is a trick, how do you understand what that the, the manipulation is made available to the viewer? So in a painting of mine, I want you to sense that this was a process. This was not a predetermined sketch was, which then became the painting. In fact, uh, I believe that if you do a sketch and then do a larger painting from your sketch and the sketch is better than the painting, get rid of the damn painting, and the painting is better than the sketch, get rid of the sketch. It's part of your responsibility as a creator to make sure that that's as close as it can be. And I quote myself on this one, every painting is a battle lost. It is the battle and it's never as perfect as you hope to be as you were working it. The more you work it, the more you were hoping that you were getting closer and very often it was not so. And it's never ever wrong to change your painting. If it's not good enough, pick up your brushes, go to work, and make it better. Either by eliminating or by adding or both. Not one, not the other. It's not a process. It's something that becomes as necessary as breathing is, is to see in your own work this life force and to have the life force read in the painting so that a viewer can sense it without necessarily having to follow it by process. And I'm doing a lot of talking. Nobody's asking any questions. So if we have to talk process. I guess we have to talk about Strapo because uh, in art, I don't believe that anybody invents anything. And I developed a process for doing a transfer of dry imagery, which is not the usual form. Very briefly, uh, most printmaking is uh, on a surface is to have wet ink or wet paint and things, and then uh, apply the wetness transfer from the plate onto the paper or, to, onto the, or canvas onto the support. In the Strapo, uh, which turns out, uh, I'm lucky about so many things. Uh, I developed a process and I was doing this because I loved the way a clean, cleaning a palette off a glass plate gave you a, a shiny surface and a controlled surface, and I thought I could to want to control that and actually make images using that. It wasn't until years later that I learned that, uh, uh, well, let me back off just a bit. Uh, in Santa Fe, I had a show with a number of uh, Strapo images in them. It was a little short period of time where foreign uh, foreign uh, countries would get gallery spaces around the country. I don't know when it dried up, and uh, and it was sponsored by the country. And in Santa Fe, the Greek government uh, sent somebody down to open up a gallery, and they did. And the local artist and included some of my work, and he said. Uh, You've got to tell me, Harold, what is the name for what you do with these works on paper? Uh, I, I said, I don't know, well, Harold, guards, dry image transfer, using. <laughs> and I said, I don't, I don't know. He says, well, in Greece, 
we have a word for it, and the word is strapo. So I say, how do you spell it? And he said, S-T-R-A-P-O. I say, we would call that strapo, so I'll call it S-T-R-A-P-P-O. So you have a word to use for the television people who are coming, so you can have something you can, you can use. So uh, only later did I know that it actually is a very technical term for doing that saving the, the surfaces of things like frescoes by transferring them to another surface and then can use and not lose the, uh, the other imagery. So the Strapo process is, uh, from my point of view, had nothing to do with knowledge about what was done in this kind of restoration of frescoes and such. What I did was I liked the look of that shine that you see uh, when you have dry acrylic paint on, on glass. And the nice thing there, or many nice things, is nothing is that precious or that permanent that changes cannot be made. And I can make as many changes as I wish until such a time as the image itself is dry. So it's acrylic paint on glass and the image is dry. But you see it through the glass and you can make any changes that an artist wants to make at that point. Once the dry image is satisfactory, you can see the brush work, you can see the line work, you can see all these other things. When that happens, then it's a matter of transferring that from on the glass to on the paper. So very briefly, I hope, uh, what you do is you build up the image. Very often, it's more transparent than it should be, and the film that contains the image uh, is very small. So I use gesso and white gesso usually, and build up the surface till it has a thickness to it that can be transferred. And then I hope this feels simple because it's fairly simple. And then what you do is put additional layers on to thicken up that image. You haven't disturbed the image at all. You can see it as it is through the glass. And then you, on the paper, you prepare the paper to, with fresh coat of, of gesso on the back of the plate, fresh coat of gesso, put the two of them together, put it under weight, let that dry so the layers of gesso bond, everything bonds except the image layer against the glass. And so effectively what the Strapo gives you is the glass, clean glass is removed and what you have left is the original image in, in, in all its strength and all its colors uh, and that, that's the Strapo method and I find it, uh, uh, it still serves me. And if I can be very playful with it. I can uh, decide I want to have spatter on there and let that dry. Whatever is, in most painting, the last strokes you make are the ones that you see when you first look at the painting. It's the last strokes you see. With the Strapo, with the Strapos, is what against the glass, because the glass will be removed, and the last thing you put on there will be just these coats of gesso having nothing to do with the image, just fattening up the image so it can be transferred. And then of the sandwich, everything now sticks together, wants to hold together, all the layers of gesso, including the one that has the first image on, on that. And under weights, all those other layers will bond. And then you peel it like a decal and leave behind the, the clear glass. So uh, it, it's kind of fun and it served me well. Uh, I've taught it now for any number of years and quite a number of people. Uh, 
use it and sometimes in very nice experimental ways. Uh, now, I'm, now I'll listen. Anybody got a question? Yeah. I probably was lying. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. So yeah. I wanted to just find out how is your process lately and are you painting every day? What I'm doing now, uh, as much as anything, is uh, preparing some images for Strapo and using uh, uh, an assistant now to do the actual transfer. The images are all, are all mine, and those are painted with the acrylics on glass yep. on, on there. So that I'm able to do because I don't have to measure in time, and I don't have the uh, physical ability to stand in front of a canvas with any kind of assurance. And the way I painted has quite a lot of, of the vigor of standing there and doing what I can can't really imagine doing. I promise nothing because uh, the five or six years ago, I would have said, I really can't do any more of these large paintings. And then along came a show about a year and a half ago, or two years ago, uh, thanks to Belfast and my daughter at Waterfall Arts, there were these 12 and 14 foot paintings and things like that. So uh, I, 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 I guess I lie to myself and then try to live up to the lie. Okay. Keep lying. <laughs> I promise nothing for tomorrow. I will promise you only I tried as hard as I fucking could on each one of those when they were done. Yes. Oh, <laughs> uh, I, only, I painted in oils, and then um, I was teaching at community college, and uh, there was no reliable storage space from session to session. So I was told about using acrylics because they would dry fast. By the way, it's not, the best, not as accurate as it should have been. So in any way, uh, I decided I, to encourage my students to paint in acrylic so they could take home the work that they were doing that day and bring it back another day. So I decided I really should learn how to handle the acrylics better. And then uh, I had a uh, stepbrother-in-law who had a place where we were going to visit during a summer vacation. And I didn't realize he was painting in acrylics, and I didn't bring any of my oil paint supplies. So for me to paint there, I started painting, trying to paint with the acrylics. So between those two things happening, the availability and such, I went back to the studio and said, wait a minute, I'm painting oil paints. I don't like what the oil paints look like as opposed to the acrylics. And I didn't like the acrylics because I didn't like what the oil paints looked like. So in both cases, I did it by neglect or whatever. So I stopped painting in, in oils. And then uh, uh, now, uh, I, I, the only time I ever use oils at all, if I do, would be uh, uh, oil-based uh, printer's ink if, if I were doing monotypes and such. I would still rely uh, on, on the oil-based one. But if not, I do everything in the acrylics. I like what it does, and I, I love breaking uh, information. One of the things I like about uh, the acrylics, it takes so much longer, yes, longer to dry because you're, you have transparent layers, you have to put on more layers all the time. And in oil paints, you can take your palette knife or you can take 
uh, a putty knife and scrape away an area you don't like and go paint right into it without any more time lost. So again, one, one more thing you hear about, that acrylics are quicker. For me, they never were. They're a much slower process than the oil paints were. Question. Yeah. So it's more so it's more a comment. Um, in terms and I think you've answered this too, Harold. You have always struck me as a man who lives in the present day totally for what's happening at the moment. And so everything that you're saying, I could just comment, everything you're saying is is saying that again to me. And is that how you see yourself? Do I see myself as Annalise, I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, I see you as constantly being present for whatever is happening in the moment. Right. Not past, not future, you're just right here, which is what we're all trying to be. Um, and do you see yourself that way? No. Okay. I, not at all. I see each painting as a continuity of another life, as I said before. I'm hoping with all my sense of formal qualities and backing and all the other things to stand there behind me, that I will continue to eliminate that which is ex ex uh, 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 exterior ex or superfluous to the imagery. Or that's all part of it. The other part is to examine and think, should something be added? Should something be modified? I let the, I try to let the paint itself talk to me as I'm implying it, not dictating what the next thing will look like, especially not in terms of imagery. No, I go I go back and, and say, I hope to see what I will lead to a perfect painting, and of course I fail, but. Uh, the idea is my job is to be as perfect in the painting as possibly be done. And that means anything extraneous, out it goes, or it gets modified. Anything which is, feels worthy of isolation for its strength, then how the areas around the, the symbol is done, and also questioning again what a symbol means, because I do have, uh, uh, I think, a lot of very evocative uh, symbols. And someone pointed out, not, not me at all in seeing it, uh, wanted to know whether this does not discuss Roe v. Wade. <laughs> and it was certainly not my intention when, when I painted that, but the, uh, the interpretations certainly goes up on, uh, on what life is and who gets protected and how you protect life and what makes things uh, grow and what is under complete control and what is, what is figurative and uh, symbols like the vessel becomes uh, that has out of that vessel is still the, but it's also the placement of, of the flowers what that means how it gets repeated in a couple of the circles in here the scope the rectangle gets reinvented uh, as here to, a, to a, a, the least ge geometric shaping in the center. And so that's what's going, I have that dialogue going on <laughs> constantly as I'm painting on, on there. It's, I welcome it and I have no way of avoiding it. It's a matter of, say, does it feel balanced? Does it feel that there's more on the left than, than there is on the right? Is there more open spaces? Is there, is there a place in which you get lost 
in the canvas and can't get out of it. I often say, I try to paint for the roving uh, eye. I want, want, want you to have things of interest throughout the canvas, and yet it cannot be where it will stop. It has to be able to move and, and to reinterpret even what your, the viewer will first see. No, no, no. I, do I look at a canvas first or use a sketch first? I do not sketch at all anymore. I do not. I don't work from photographs. I don't work from sitters. I, I don't do any of that. What I do very often start with, and now you may be the first to know, I use, I clean the brush that I was working on the other painting onto the new canvas so that I don't have to be overwhelmed right. by the demanding white. Yeah. I, so it's too scary. So I stop applying So you, color. you start to paint, and then the concept comes to you? And then I, then I try to solve it as a two-dimensional problem, basically. It has to look like I, that it balances, that it works, that the colors are uh, are resonating and such because color, because the thrust of some colors coming forward, other colors receding, and that will not remain the same. It may vary from step to step to step to step in, in the painting. And so, it, but if it doesn't hold up two dimensionally, I, I, then it's, it's too far gone too far gone uh, in, that, in that other direction, whatever it is, which is one of the reasons I don't want it, something to look like a rendering, which would be a more three-dimensional quality than a suggested one dominating with the two-dimensional quality. So I try to solve that knowingly very, very early on. And uh, I would, my palette choices probably will make themselves known at that point. Yeah. But it has to, it has to, it has to serve well enough. It has to balance out, and whether it balances out in terms of separate areas or others, I don't know uh, until I'm working there because none of it is locked in to where a sketch or a photograph or anything else would be. So I, I'm free to try to see it as a stage and not a result at any one time. Does that help? It does, yeah. Thank you. Anybody? Yeah. It is, it's a, it's a, if I can, the difference between a strapo and a monotype. It is a monotype. It's a single image, complete, total image, one time, that's it. There's none of it left, there's no ghost left or anything else. The image is precisely the skin that I had painted on the glass. How do you make your decision to do a strapo, which is sort of different well, I keep, versus pursuing the model? Uh, how do I decide when it will be a strapo? I, I, I wish I had an answer. It, I don't have one because it just, it's at any, any point because it's fluid enough so that if I start going in one direction and don't like it, I, I have, just take a, a paper towel or something, wipe, wipe, wipe it off and work in there. It doesn't have that sense of being precious in the same way. And uh, uh, one of the things I, I do when I was doing workshops in Strava is having people just take a day off to just paint on glass. 
it has a different feeling and a different sense completely. And don't use plexi, I think, because I don't trust the, the, the plexi skin and the polymers that make up the, uh, the paint that they might bind, whereas on glass they don't. So when it lifts, it lifts from the glass completely as, as uh, the one very controlled image. But I, on some of them, you didn't have some, I can cut out with a razor blade carefully or, and just take the strip out. And then since everything is now sealed in the layers of uh, gesso, and then decide that it should be a red line and just paint in red without having to be careful. And only the red paint will be against the glass. And uh, when, when it's transferred, it will be a, an important, strong. Yeah. Having trouble hearing you. Sure. Uh, I was really curious about your editing process, how you choose parts of your painting to paint out. And I was wondering if, how many times, I'm sure it's different for everybody. Oh, these, these are old things here. I, <laughs> they don't always work like they should. Right. Paint out. And I was just really curious about how often, um, not on average, I'm sure every painting's different, but like, had, did you ever have one that you did no edits, and did you ever have one where you did hundreds of Oh, at, at, that is such a great question. <laughs> at one time, I could have answered it differently. But what's happened, it may have been because of my age, or size, or anything else. It no, it no longer feels, uh, uh, that directed at any point that I feel that I have to preserve that uh, automatically at that time. But it will happen. It will happen when I would say, uh, uh, like, I may have started painting red onto the, uh, to the vase o over in here and decided I do not want it to look like a flat total surface. And I may have at that time, start to change what that looks like. But it could have happened after I started doing the blue and allowed some texture in there, and then say, uh-oh, what I want to balance that somewhere, and then go back into that. So it's, it's not procedural, it, but it, 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 yes, it is a decision that keeps getting made on what is, is that good enough yet? If not, what do I have to do to improve it? Does it work with what's around it? Is it part of the cohesion that I'm, that I'm after? And I don't know that until after very often, until I've done it and tried. And the, that is an advantage. Acrylics allows me to make the changers from layer to layer to layer more easily. And, uh, and that's probably why it's such a definite choice for me in, in my work. And I hope that answers it. Yes? Me? Harold. <laughs> um, uh, soundtrack. Um, I remember you were at Rob Goodale's barn one time, looking around at his work. Uh, you may not remember that, but I remember you said, at the time you said, what really I like about it is when my, in my own painting, I come to a point where I've never seen it before, and that's when I stop. And I was like, that always kind of inspired me. And it's, it's been a sort of a moment of uh, a realization in my own work to, where is that moment? Is that, <laughs> does, that, does that actually say what you meant to say? <laughs> yeah, it probably is not as defined as you make it sound, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> There's also, no, it's time for a scotch or, or get on the phone or do something else. Maybe this is a stopping point that I could stop at and, and not having to continue work right now. But what, it's generally, yeah, it's right along with, with the, it, within the process. That, yeah, this, this, this just isn't good enough. I will come back to it. 
or yes, it's good enough, I will work around it and preserve it. Decision making, decision making, decision. That's how I get old. Yes. Yes. And you were definitely an abstract expressionist that was making sure there was no figurative elements. You were right, to yes. Away. Yeah. Could you share how the definitions, because there are rules, I remember there are rules about the kind of work that you did as an abstract expressionist. Could you take us from those rules and the kinds of, and the expressionist stuff that you're doing now, was there a difference or are you still following the same, what is a painting rules that you started? Procedurally, it stays pretty close to being the same. The difference was there were people like uh, began to allow the figurative, the, the, the Koonings, where the figure came out of the painting and out of the paint. And uh, it began to say another way of looking. I had to re-examine where everything was in the same plane. And it was not only me, I would absorb what else was happening in, in the world. And uh, the influence for a while of cubism was stronger than I did have the geometric abstractionist play into the cubist thing. And, I, and for me, it became rectangles and they became chairs. So it wasn't that I planned to start and get into the chairs because uh, I've discovered with other people's response as well that in many ways, one of the loneliest things we know is a single chair. We react to, the, to that. Yet I didn't develop that to describe loneliness. I was a way of using the rectangles and not because the abstract expressions were, were big circular movements. And I felt it had to be something else. So you have subject development tingling on this side because you begin to see it in other people's work. And then on the other side of it, you begin to see a different handling of the paint itself. So you're beginning to get things like uh, 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 color runs, uh, Frankenthalers, uh, stain canvas, you begin to see many different ways into in which you're looking at the same thing, but you're not seeing the same thing the same way. And it's a matter of juggling all, you're a juggler. You're a juggler who selects all the time. What do I leave in? What do I take out? And if I take out, what do I put in? But the temper of the times matter. It matters tremendously. You have to be sensitive to the, to the world in which you live. And certainly, the world of the painter is one of the worlds in which I live. Oh, I hate these old ears, even my hearing aids. And I'm not really picking up the information. Describing yourself as a badass as a kid. Did I say that? Well, you didn't. I told the truth. Okay. But you probably did at one point. But I liked it. I was always thrown by the idea that being a painter was a choice and that the choice of the kind of painting that you were doing was very exciting time. Right. So that part of defining who you were and making sure that you were doing work that nobody would like was very important. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think I've gotten over a little bit of that, maybe not all of it. If somebody really likes the work, is, do they really know enough for me to be proud that they like it? Because uh, having taught very often workshop type things, I understand the hunger for appreciation for what you do is so heavy that you don't care where you get it from. 
So somebody who knows nothing about art will come by and say, oh, I like it, or I want to buy it, or whatever it is. And their praise is far more important than your own evaluation, where you know so much more than they did. But the desire and need for approval oh, dominates. And you can't let that happen. And uh, by the way, in a good gallery like this one does not give me room to let that happen. Yes. How do you feel graffiti art, how do you feel about it, one? And then number two, do you feel like it influenced or worked into your art at all? A good, good question, really good question. I remember how excited I was when I got to see the uh, Caspiet, uh, 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 at, at Mary Boone's gallery. Uh, seeing things that began to look more spontaneous became an asset instead of looking uh, as i might have felt earlier that it was sloppy work instead of it became spontaneous and and very emotional and i began to realize that uh, in so many ways in the treatment of paint i've allowed that experimentation to uh, be quite casual in my approach, but finally, in some of my later work, very, very much having to be utilized and refined. But allowing the accent is part of that. But the other part of it is the expressive thing. I've even done some paintings with, uh, with words in it, but they have to work with the painting instead of it being a label for it. And uh, that's by impulse. So it may have been because my own mood or something. Uh, I may have, we have no more time than be written in, but it has to fit in by design and other things. And it has to be something that I found necessary to do, and I think it comes out of that impulse of street art, fresh art, something that challenges. And art should be a challenge, and the viewing of art should be a challenge. And if my work is successful and somebody has it, they should find new things in it, as well as possibly appreciate the older ones. As they get to know it, they should be, it should be a form of communication of me as painter and the painting that results. And we live in, we always live in very tough times. And just living is tough. And I think it's a place in which the, the desire for resolution also has to have on the other end the, uh, a sense of uh, vitality uh, of, of hu humanness, a human. This is made by a single person. It's not done by machines. It's not done by corporate standards. It's an individual doing what an individual thinks is be important. That particular day, that particular moment, that particular life. Yeah. I, I probably reached the edge of your tolerance, but thank you guys. Thank you for seeing the work. Thank you for the questions.
Oh. Yeah, do you have a favorite paint brand? Uh, pro probably. I'm not as. Uh, uh, every once in a while, I fall in love with the color from a thing. It's, uh, because I have to order stuff, particularly down in Florida. I use Utrex paints, and things like their uh, cadmium yellow, no longer available, is one of gorgeous paint, both the medium and, and, the, and I adored it. And other brands, not quite as, uh, but, I will, but I will use the other. The, it's, uh, uh, there, there, there are many, they're, they're just, there are really a lot of good paints on, on the market. And uh, um, I'm, I'm not, as I say, there's certain colors at certain times. Like they have a blue, which I would like using a great deal, but I would, uh, I know from what it is, it's not as pigment, the pigment is not as pure as it would be in uh, with some of the other brands like Liquitex and things. But Liquitex uh, being much more expensive for the, uh, uh, the gesso is not as good as the Utrex because Utrex is cheaper, but it has a, bi a bigger molecule, so it actually covers better than the more refined one that you might have to use if you were doing a standard portrait on linen kind, kind of thing. So, and uh, my, my brushes, as one of my friends here can determine, my brushes are, are a disgrace. <laughs> and, but they serve my purpose. And so it, it's, uh, I'm, uh, I, I will have calls from friends and say, hey, have you tried the badger brush from so and so? And, nah. No, <laughs> no, no the, you, you have, I feel you have to adapt to what, the, what you have. Yeah. But, but selecting a reasonable brand uh, you're not going to go wrong. Part two, real quick. Um, if, like, do you just use straight acrylic paint, or do you mix in like certain acrylic mediums? Very, I use very little medium. One of the things I liked about the acrylics is that they're simple enough. I can thin with water. I can layer it and let it dry. And, uh, but, but, big but. One of the things I loved about the oil paints, not as good in acrylics. You cannot prejudge what mixed colors will look like in acrylic paints. You take a red and a yellow, mix them together, hoping for a bright orange. You ain't going to get it. It won't, just won't happen. In oils, you get close. But in acrylics, to really get a decent orange, you have to buy tube of orange paint. So with that, go out and buy paint and get some brushes and go to work. This is the Harold Guard, anybody can do it. <laughs>